those who believe that the church, the body of Christ, began at Acts 13, and I gave eight points, and, but the eight point, the eighth point had six points to it. <laughs> and uh, so we, we not only made, uh, gave you the eight points that they would believe that would drive them to think that the body of Christ, the, uh, the dispensation of grace, began in Acts 13 with the launching of Paul's ministry, but we went through the seven points and showed that some of those points, there's another way of looking at them. And, uh, and then the eighth point that has the six parts to it, uh, we started on it, and I looked at the clock and realized, oh, no, we can't go there. <laughs> so I said we'd start on it this time. But to get started, take your Bibles and go back to Ephesians. Start in chapter 1, but have chapter 3 ready at the same time. Because I'll just read you a mid-Acts dispensational statement, usually found in statements of faith of mid-Acts churches. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a general statement. It's not specific enough, so it's usually accepted by most people who believe in a mid-Acts beginning of the body of Christ. So that the mid-Acts dispensational statement would be that the church, which is Christ's body. Now I stop there to remind you, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, says that God hath put all things under his feet, under the feet of Jesus Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I don't know who said it first, but uh, boy, it sticks in my mind every time I read that verse. It says, the church which is his body. And the reason it says the church which is his body, there is a church which is not his body. <laughs> and that is, there is a kingdom church. Church is just called out assembly. But Paul's specifically talking about this position that Jesus Christ has as head over all things, exalted in the heavens is the context, and that God made him to be head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So that when we talk about mid-Acts dispensationalism, we're talking about the church, which is his body, or we could call it the dispensation of grace, that's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. So we're talking about the church, which is his body, or the dispensation of grace, um, began with the calling and commissioning of the Apostle Paul before he wrote his first epistle. And that leaves a lot of flexibility there where a mid-Acts person says, yeah, that's true, and that way all of Paul's epistles are written to the body of Christ. And, uh, and, and so there's not too much uh, argument over, over that. It, it settles, it's not Acts 2, it's not Acts 28, but that's a mid-Acts dispensational view of when the body of Christ, the church, the body of Christ, uh, the dispensation of grace began. But we've been going a little bit deeper than that and asking the question, so was it at his conversion in Acts chapter 9, or was it at his first church ministry in Antioch in Acts chapter 11, or was it at the launching of his, uh, of his apostolic journeys in Acts chapter 13? And we've already talked about the 11 view and the 13 view, and uh, today we're going to consider the Acts chapter 9 view. But before we do that, those six subpoints of point number eight that we didn't cover last week about uh, that uh, uh, Acts 13, or the reason it's, it's, good, it's a good introduction into the Acts 13, or Acts 9 view, but we said the fourth, the eighth point. Uh, that we made about what an Acts 13er would believe is they would think that all the events between Acts 9 and 13 are on kingdom ground. And that's why I, I listed those next points there and I didn't take the time to rebut them but I, it is a good way to start uh, showing that there, there's another way of looking at those, 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 that time between Acts 9 and 13 because that's really the real difference between an Acts 9 and an Acts 13 or what's taking place between those chapters. And, uh, and, and so they, they have two different views. So the ones who think that it's on kingdom ground just make the statement that Saul's conversion was according to the kingdom gospel. And if you look, let's go to book of Acts chapter 9. And Ananias goes, in, and Paul is brought blind, he's Saul, he's brought to Damascus, it was outside the city of Damascus, he met the Lord. 
And Ananias goes to him, and in verse 17 it says, Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And uh, so here he is being saved under the kingdom gospel. And if you read it in Acts chapter 22 and in, 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 uh, uh, well, it's Acts 21 verse, no, it's probably not. It's Acts 22, I'm sure. And verse 20, no. It is Acts 21, verse 20 says, And when he heard it, they glorify God, no, and said unto him, Thus, no, no, that's not what I want either. It's way too far. Paul's arrested. It's got to be 22. Anyhow, it's where Ananias said to Paul, Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The point is, is that uh, uh, that, that is Saul's conversion. It's under the kingdom program. There it is, 22, 16, uh, 22 chap, 22nd chapter, verse 16. And... Uh, and while Paul is saved under that kingdom gospel, why he was saved, why he was converted, if you're back in chapter 9, it says in verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a, uh, a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, unto, and he said Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what to do. Now my point in reading that is, this is not how the average kingdom saint got saved. The Lord didn't peer a light from heaven on the average kingdom saint and, uh, and call him. So Paul had a very unique calling. And it's, so when you say it's according to the kingdom gospel, certainly Ananias would only know the kingdom gospel. But God is doing something special here, and when you read it in Acts chapter 26, now that is, if you want to flip over there, Paul's account of what was said on the road to Damascus, he says in verse 15, Acts 26, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. So you talk about the commissioning of the Apostle Paul took place on the road to Damascus. And uh, so it's part of Paul's calling. So he might have been done what the Ananias told him to do, but he's certainly not saved for the kingdom program. Uh, he's called right from the very beginning of his conversion. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about more things about that. But uh, look also at Acts chapter 9 and look at verse 30. Here's another point that the Acts 13ers bring out. And what they say is that the kingdom church continued to multiply after Saul's conversion. Verse 30 says, Which, when the brother knew, they brought him down to Caesarea. There, there's a, an attack against Saul of Tarsus, so they sent him away, and sent him forth unto Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So they're saying, look, the kingdom program's just going on fine. And, uh, and so that ministry continues. And yes, the verse is talking about that it's continuing, but did you notice that it says they had rest? According to the prophetic program, they're not supposed to have rest. They were supposed to enter into the tribulation and suffer persecution. But with Saul's conversion, the church is at rest. 
and something different is going on here rather than, than the per continuation of the prophetic program. So they argue one point, but there's another point to look at concerning that, those things. And as we would look further, you could look in Acts chapter 12 and verse 24, even as far as Acts 20 and 21 verse 20, and the kingdom church still is multiplying. And that's past the Acts 13 and, and so forth. So that, uh, that ministry is continuing on, but it's not continuing on according to the prophetic events that said was going to take place. The fact that they're at rest tells you something else is happening rather than the continua continuation of prophecy. The next is that they would say, well, Peter's ministry continued in Acts chapter 9, if, if you, after you pass verse 31 here, beginning in verse 32 to the end of the chapter, it's all about Peter. And, uh, and even the chapter 10 and the first part of chapter 11 is all about Peter and the, and the 12 apostles. And so you, the point is, is they're continuing their ministry. And yes, they're continuing their ministry, but Peter continued his ministry until the day he died. And when you read, read Galatians chapter 2, that when they finally understand what Paul's ministry is, they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship, Peter, James, and, and John, that they would go to the heathen, or they would go to the circumcision, and Paul would go to the heathen. So my point is, P Peter's ministry continued, yes, it continued in chapter 9, it continued to the day he died, until after he wrote First and Second Peter. So that's not an indication that the body of Christ did not begin in chapter 9. Um, in fact, the Acts chapter 10 and 11 is said to be a picture of Gentile salvation in the kingdom. And that is, when you get to chapter 10, that's all, you start about this, this man Cornelius, a Gentile, who Peter is sent to and, and preached to him. And, and while it could be, it depends how people teach that chapter, there's a lot of arguments. Is Cornelius, is, is he a member of the body of Christ? Is he a member of the kingdom uh, church? And the Bible doesn't say, so we could argue till we're red in the face. But the point is, is Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 while they might, some might draw a picture of Gentile salvation in the kingdom program, that's not how Peter and the apostles looked at it. Uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 10, just a couple verses here, in verse, well, you could read a lot, but, but in verse 9, Peter has this vision of this food that comes down, and some of it's unclean food, and then in the vision, uh, verse 13 it says, and there came a voice to him, arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have not eaten anything that is common or unclean. And that's like a Gentile is, is, is unclean and it's common. Uh, and the voice spake unto him again second, the second time, what God has cleansed call thou not common. And this was done thrice, three times, and the vessel was received up into heaven. And that doesn't end there. Now Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made uh, inquiry for Simon, uh, for, uh, for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which is surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, and go unto them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them." <laughs> And the whole point is, if this was Gentile salvation into the kingdom, why is Peter having all this revelation, go and don't doubt? Has to, three times the Lord has to tell him, the Holy Spirit has to encourage him, and Peter goes not knowing why he's even going there. When you get to chapter 11, verse 1, it's not just Peter not understanding this. Verse 1, it says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest unto men uncircumcised, and did eat with them. And now Peter's got to defend why he did that, and that's what this chapter is about. And, and he said, you know, God, God sent me to do this, and, uh, and who was I to withstand God? So when you get to verse 17... It says, For as much then as God gave them the like gifts as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I should withstand God? And when they heard, the rest of the apostles, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. My point is, this don't sound like something they was part of their commission and they're doing. Something is different here. 
And they was, there was going to be a time for Gentile salvation, that they were to go to the othermost parts of the earth, they were to preach the gospel to every creature, but this isn't the time. This is taking place outside the prophetic timetable because things have changed. So rather than using it as an argument for Acts 13, to me it's an argument for Acts 9. Um, then the Antioch church. We talked about this already several times, twice I know, that the Antioch church were the, at Acts 13, or said this is a Jewish kingdom church. I pointed out to you, no, it's a Gentile church because they had, they're solving the issue that Gentile doesn't have to be circumcised to be saved because they're trying to pass that doctrine to the church at Antioch, and that's where Paul comes from there to Jerusalem to settle that matter with the 12 apostles. So they're not a Jewish kingdom church, and, and they, they got saved through the gospel of the uncircumcision, which Paul was the preacher of. But I want you to know something else. Come to Acts chapter 13. Oh, wait a minute. You've got to start in chapter 11. Isn't this where I was going to show that? Or is that later? Well... In verse 27 of Acts chapter 11, now this is, Paul's already ministered in Antioch for a year. But notice what happens here. And in, the th in, in these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch, and there stood up one of na them named uh, Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth, drought, throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Um, so you ha what you have here is you've got the Gentiles in, in, in uh, Antioch, Syria there, sending relief down to the Jews in Jerusalem which shows something out of balance there, because rather than the Jews being the one that's prospering, here the Gentiles are bringing relief to the Jews down in Jerusalem. Um, in Acts 13, 27. No, that's not what I want. Okay, let's just leave that there, because this next one. In, in Acts chapter 12, and I do like this point, that, and I said it last time, so I'm not going to reteach it, but in Acts chapter 12 and Acts 13, it points out the fact you got the killing, James is dead. They tried to kill Peter, but God spared him, and we all look at that as realizing God's going to use Peter yet to confirm Paul's ministry and to write First and Second Peter. Um, but then, then it ends, Acts 12 ends with Herod, acting like, almost like he's a god, like he's an antichrist. And so the whole point is that this kind of looks like kingdom ground as they're suffering and the antichrist arises, and then you get to chapter 13 and now it's all about Paul. So they, they use that argument. And uh, while, while I do see, you know, the apostles ending, Peter being spared, and Herod looking like an antichrist, the other thing you've got to ask, it was he? He wasn't the Antichrist. <laughs> the Antichrist is yet to come. So that tells you that while it looked like things were progressing, it wasn't progressing or it's not going into the tribulation because he's not the Antichrist. And there's another thing to look at that. Now, now here, look at Acts 11 and look at verse 30. When they sent that relief from the Antioch church to Jerusalem, notice who they sent it by. He says, which also, Acts 11 for 30, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So then you start reading about the events that are going on in Jerusalem with the twelve apostles and with Herod and so forth in Acts chapter 12. Now look at the last verse in Acts chapter 12. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John whose surname was Mark. Interesting that the events in Acts chapter 12 center around Paul's visit to Jerusalem and then his return back to Antioch. So, so my point is, is there's these things going on in Jerusalem, but there's something different going on centered around the ministry of Barnabas and Saul, and, and the Holy Spirit 
points us that they go there, and then that chapter ends where they go back. So that my point is, is simply to say that uh, it doesn't look like the kingdom program progressing. It looks like God's doing something different, and the Holy Spirit is pointing our attention to Barnabas and Saul and the church at Antioch. So th those were the arguments that we, we didn't finish talking about last week about Acts 13. So let me give you, let's start talking about more in the affirmative of the position of Acts 9. Why someone would think, like myself, because... <laughs> You're going to find out I'm not going to give you any arguments against this view. <laughs> but uh, why some think, and like Leon was trying to express last week, like, why are we talking about all this? We know it's the conversion of Saul. <laughs> and I had a phone call doing the same thing, but no, that's not everybody's view. And there's reasons they have for having other view. But it is true that, that the Acts 9 position, that it just seems like the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is the key to the whole matter. It really, in many different ways, and I have this in a progressive way that I want to take it in this order. Uh, so we first have to remember that in Acts chapter 7, go back there, because either this is the fall of Israel or it's not. And to me, the events that take place at the end of Acts chapter 7, they don't progress, which shows it is the fall of the nation of Israel. I'll explain what I mean by that. In Acts chapter 7, in verse 54, says, you know, Stephen has just preached to the, the Grecian Jews who brought him before the council, and so he preached to all the Jews, and they rejected his message, and, and when they did, uh, he said, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. And then he says in verse 54, when, uh, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see heaven open, heaven's open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried with a loud voice uh, and, and, and stopped their ears and ran uh, upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So Saul's tied into Cornelius here. Uh, by the way, I'm not, this is not even one of my points, so I'll say it now. When I taught a series about the threes in Acts, three times you're going to go, the Acts will take you back to Stephen, showing this is a very significant point. Um, but anyhow, the, uh, verse 59 says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon the Lord, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my sight. And when he kneeling down and cried with a loud voice, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now that emphasis about Jesus Christ standing is an emphasis according to prophecy that wrath was going to be dispensed by God. In fact, I want you to see two places. Get Isaiah chapter 2 and then get Revelation. I'm going to do backwards. Get Revelation 5. We'll not study the context, just look at the verses that talk about Jesus Christ standing. In Isaiah chapter 2, in verse 19, it says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for the fear of the Lord, and for the glory of His majesty, when He arises to shake terribly the earth. Now those Jews at the stoning of Stephen, when he said, I see Jesus standing, they know what that means. That, they don't want to hear that. As if they're now rejecting Jesus Christ and he's going to come back and make his enemies his footstool. And, and, and so when he says, I see him standing, that verse is he's going to stand to shake terribly the earth. you got Isaiah 2, look at Isaiah chapter 3 and uh, uh, verse 13. The Lord standeth to plea... And the Lord standeth up to plea, and standeth to judge the people. And that's the nation of Israel. That judgment begins at the house of God. So that Stephen seeing Jesus Christ standing is a significant place in prophecy where God was about to dispense wrath. Now we know he didn't dispense wrath after that. And nowhere in prophecy is there a place where Jesus is going to stand up and then decide not to dispense wrath and sit back down again. 
That standing is marked in prophecy of a time of wrath. That's why, and I just picked two places in the book of Revelation. First look at Revelation chapter 5, because this one just goes past everyone, and at verse 6, where John sees this vision of heaven, and he says, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and in the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. As he's preparing to see the events of the wrath of God poured out, he sees a lamb who was slain stood up in the midst of that throne. You know, there's a verse that's real popular, but most people don't think of it this way. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I what? Thank you. <laughs> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now everyone thinks, oh, you just invite asking to come in, let me come in. Standing at the door and knocking, he's about to judge. <laughs> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh. What? His coming. <laughs> You're going to have to overcome this tribulation, this wrath that's going to be poured out. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne? He that hath ears, uh, let, him, uh, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. But the point of that standing is to pour out wrath. And the fact that we're studying, looking at the Acts 9 here is... Of the prophetic program, Jesus Christ stood to judge, but rather than dispensing wrath, wrath did not get dispensed. We're talking about the dispensation of the grace of God. Something else got dispensed uh, after the point of Israel's fall. Now that leads to the, to the other part about that, and that is that's prayer of Stephen. That's, that is a an interesting thing. Stephen said, lay not this sin to their charge. And he said it by the Holy Ghost just before he died. So was it the fall of Israel or was it not? Now, if it's not, then it, but it's not according to prophecy because Jesus Christ, according to prophecy, wasn't going to sit back down. Wrath was coming. So somehow, what, something has to happen here where the Lord Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 32 that bla all manner of sin against the bl and blasphemy against the Son will be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this world or the world to come. Now how can Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost, say, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And after the Lord warned that they reject here, they speak against the Holy Ghost, there's no forgiveness. And the only answer really to that is there's no forgiveness in that world or the world to come, the kingdom program according to prophecy, but there was in the dispensation of grace, because today a Jew and Gentile can be saved by the gospel of the grace of God. That that prayer, the only way that that prayer could be answered is that there's a new age began. It's not that age, that world, or the world to come, but a new age came in with the rising up of uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And that's where the dispensing of grace takes place. Uh, one thing for sure is that the prophetic clock stopped after Acts chapter 7. The, if, you, if you look in, no, you can't, I don't want to actually go by ushers, but in, we have Daniel's prophecy prophesied of Israel's program up to the 69th week. After that 69th week comes the cross of Jesus Christ, and then according to Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, the Lord said that he asked the Father, give me one more year, and let me, you know, dung the tree, and if it bears fruit well, and if not, then cut it down. And it looks like the early Acts period is that extension of one more year. But when you come to Acts chapter 9, lots of years pass. Acts chapters 1 through 7 only looks like it's one year going by. But I can prove that when you get to Acts chapter 9, more than that one year got, went by. Look at Acts chapter 9. Get this. Get Acts chapter 9 and Galatians chapter 1. Acts chapter 9, Galatians 1. Acts chapter 9, verse 22. Now, Saul just got converted. We'll back up even a little bit another place. And, uh, but it says in verse 22, And Saul increased the more in strength 
and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus. Maybe, maybe I'll do it now. Look, look at verse 20. Now Paul just got converted, just got his sight back, was baptized, and it says in verse 20, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. That's all he knew. Is that he realized Jesus is the Christ, so that's what he preached. But it goes on and says, uh, But they that heard him was amazed and said, Is not this uh, him that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem, and, uh, and came hither for to the intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving this is very Christ. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews consult, uh, counseled to kill him. So Saul, the first thing, he can only preach Christ. But he continues to increase in strength. But he starts increasing in his ability to confound the Jews. And many days go by until the Jews don't want to hear him anymore. That many days, look over in Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians 1, Paul, and to me this is really important to the, the whole point of, of even another point we'll make later, so I'll start in verse 11. Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me was not after men. Neither was I taught it, neither received I it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and was pro and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals of my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter. Now in your Acts 9 record, after the Jews in Damascus try to kill Paul, then he goes to Jerusalem. So that many days in Acts 9.23 is a three-year period of time. And in that three-year period of time, Paul had been in Damascus, went out into Arabia, and came back to Damascus before he finally went to Jerusalem. So there's the, when you get to Saul's conversion, all of a sudden the prophetic timetable, you're way out of time. The, the God's timing for Israel, the prophetic calendar, had stopped. And now time is going by. Not only do we see them at rest in Jerusalem, no longer is there persecution, but now we see that a whole bunch of time is passing, where just in those few verses, Paul spent three years. And he th spent three years in Arabia. W one of the things I think is super important is Galatians, when Paul says, I certify that the gospel I preached, what he's certifying is that he got that message not from man, not from the apostles, but directly from Jesus Christ in some place in that time of those three years that he went off into Arabia and came back. So that talking about this time period, he's actually certifying the, the gospel message that he preached. He's gotten the revelation that he preached. You might remember that we said the Acts 13ers, they make a big point that he's preaching justification by faith in Acts chapter 13. He learned that in Acts chapter 9 before he ever went down to Jerusalem because the gospel he preached, he, he had it before he left Damascus. So, but anyhow, the time is going by. When you get to Galatians 2 verse 1, it says, Then 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem, and that matches the Acts 15 account. So that the time Paul, he goes, he's only a short time in Jerusalem, but it was three years before he ever left Damascus, short time in Jerusalem. They sent him away to Tarsus, and then he comes back and pastors that church in Antioch, as we, we read that verse, that he pastored there for a whole year before he then launched his Gentile ministry. Now how long he took that Gentile ministry, if it was a couple years, whatever it might be, some, that, that time between Acts chapter 9 and chapter 12, where he pastored that church is something like 10 years. So, because by Jack, Acts chapter 15, it's been 14 plus years. The whole point is, where is that in the prophetic calendar? <laughs> We're not on the prophetic calendar. It stopped in Acts chapter 7. Something new has been going on ever since Acts chapter 9, and it all centers around the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Um, 
and that conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now this is the main point. <laughs> Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Most would have expected me to start here. <laughs> Paul talks about, warns Timothy about those that are getting away from what he taught. At verse 11, what he taught is said to be according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. It centers around Paul's conversion and the gospel he was given. You know, when someone points out Paul was saved by being water baptized under the kingdom program, when you read this passage you say, well, that's what Ananias told him. But that's not how Paul looked at his conversion. He, he was saved in order to receive a gospel message that's going to be preached to the Gentiles about our salvation. So we don't get saved by what Ananias told Paul to do, or Saul. We get saved by what Jesus Christ revealed to Paul about our salvation. That's why he calls it the gospel of our salvation. But, so it's committed to Paul's trust. And he says in verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, and I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. <laughs> Paul became the first of a pattern of all who get saved after. God started something with Paul. That's, there's no doubt about that when he calls himself the first. And, and he calls his conversion the exceeding abundant grace of God. Uh, not, not that he was saved as he deserves it, because he was called a blasphemer. Well, there's a blasphemer who got saved. Not in this age, the age Jesus Christ was talking in, or the kingdom age that was prophesied to come, but in a new age called the dispensation of the grace of God. An age that he calls here the first of the long-suffering of God. Now hold your place here, because you've got to go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And Peter's explaining to his people why that kingdom never showed up. After he said they were preaching, it was at hand, they were offering the kingdom, and it never came. So he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And then he warns that the day of the Lord will come. You get over to verse 15 an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Peter says that this long-suffering that began with the Apostle Paul has postponed the coming of the kingdom program. And you're going to have to read Paul's epistles to understand what God's doing in this age of grace. And it's so different than what his program was all about. So that that conversion of Saul of Tarsus, when Paul says he's the first of a pattern of the long-suffering of God to all who believe hereafter, it's a, a time delay in the prophetic program. It's called the dispensation of grace. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I say is when, when I argue with the Acts 9 position, or Acts 13 position against the Acts 9 position, Sometimes when, I, when I'm arguing with them, we're you know, maybe fussing about when did the body of Christ begin? Well, to me, it began with Paul. They say it can't begin with one man. Why not? <laughs> Especially when you realize Paul, he's Saul, who was also called Paul, right? Well, that's a Jew and a Gentile in one body. Saved in Acts chapter 9. He wasn't saved in Acts chapter 13. He was saved in Acts chapter 9. And I believe he'd be saved right into the body of Christ. He's the first of a pattern of all here after, a pattern of long-suffering of God. And so he's a picture of the dispensation of grace. But my point is, sometimes we're arguing about when did the body of Christ begin? 
But if we ask the question, when did God dispense grace? Who could deny that Saul on the road to Damascus, who you talk about someone who looked like the, lead, the one who would be the Antichrist, that he is the one that God turns around and gives the message of grace and Gentile salvation and, and goes out and preaches that message and that while he's preaching that, it's the long-suffering of God delaying the kingdom program. To me, it's always been as simple as, when did God dispense grace? He didn't wait to Acts 13 to dispense grace. You might try to argue that the body of Christ didn't begin until then, but if they're the same thing, and I do believe they are, the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ began with Saul's conversion in, in Acts chapter 9. And, and Paul making that statement about him being the first, to me, verifies that. The blasphemer who got saved in a new age, the dispensation of grace. Uh, now there's two more points that I want to make. I got the time. And that is, um, between Acts 9 and 13, the, the question is, you know, what's going on in that time period? Well, the Acts record will cover what's going on with Peter and them, but there is some teaching about what's going on with the Apostle Paul. Again, get Acts chapter 9. I guess I should have told you to put a piece of paper. Acts chapter 9, Galatians chapter 2. I was trying to think if I needed you to look at Galatians 2, but I think you do. Because the verses we didn't read last time we were there. Now we're going to look here, and rather than think about, okay, in between 9 and 13 we're covering the prophetic program, there's Cornelius, the 11, the Antioch church, and all of that. What's Paul doing? What's Saul doing during that time? Well, the last we read in Acts chapter 9 is that when he was, it went to Jerusalem, it's interesting, remember Stephen was preaching to those Grecians, he was in, uh, speaking to those, uh, the synagogues of the people who were outside of Jerusalem but meeting in Jerusalem. Uh, if you look at Acts 9 verse 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. The same group of people that killed Stephen are now going after him. So verse 30 says, And when the brother knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth unto Tarsus. Now usually when you go to Caesarea, I didn't bring the map up, you go to Caesarea, you go a little bit north, but you go to the border of the Mediterranean Sea, and most of the time you think you catch a ship and go to Tarsus, because Tarsus is, if you go to the... If you go straight up the Mediterranean, the first territory is Cilicia, is where Tarsus is at. And so you can take a ship up that way. But look at Galatians chapter 1. Paul talking about those early days. He first went to Damascus, you know, the three years went by. He spent only 15 days in that trip to Jerusalem. So then you pick up in verse 18 of, oh, it's Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Now these things I write unto you, Behold the Lord uh, bef before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia. Oh, you didn't learn about that in Acts. Oh, you left, they took him to Caesarea, and then he ends up in Tarsus. But how did he get to Tarsus? Well, when you read this, he went through the area of Syria and Cilicia. That means if you went north from Caesarea, you go into uh, 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 to Syria, and then if you go, what's that, <laughs> east from there, you go into Cilicia, and that's where Tarsus is at. So I realized Paul didn't catch a ship. He went through those territories during that time that he would, the way, you know, he, he was, he's left there at, uh, at Tarsus until Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, it's, we have Barnabas sees what's going on in Antioch and goes to Tarsus and gets Saul and brings him back and then Paul teaches there for a whole year. Then there's that problem that takes place where the, the church at, at, at uh, uh, Antioch, Syria, 
that the, Gen that the Jews are saying the Gentiles had to be circumcised to be saved. So Paul goes to Jerusalem and settles the matter that no, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised to be saved. Galatians tells you they perceived the grace that was given unto the Apostle Paul and they gave him the right hand of fellowship, but they wrote a letter. And remember that letter in Acts chapter 15? Look at that. Acts chapter 15. You think this argument only is between Jerusalem and Antioch, but it's not. It says in Acts chapter 15 and verse 23, and they wrote letters uh, by them after this manner, and the apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Well, where, where, when did Gentile churches get established in Syria and Cilicia? Well, those days that you don't know what Paul's doing, he wasn't just doing nothing, sitting in Tarsus waiting for Barnabas to show up to tell them what to do. He was, he was, that ministry he was given on the road to Damascus, he's been working it. He's been working it in Syria and in Cilicia, and then he finally has that church over in Antioch. And they're Gentile churches, and, and so they've been established. Paul's been doing something all that time. And, and so you see them showing up here and realize that Paul had a ministry. And, and the point, too, then, just the, the end one is I already threw it in there to make sure I would get there is that Paul learned his gospel and preached his gospel message. If he went out into Arabia for three years and learned what the Gentile ministry was, what the, the gospel message that he was to preach, that he certifies, that he didn't get it from man because he had all this time away from those other apostles, away from other men, just him and the Lord, that those three years that he spent out in Arabia and back to Damascus, the gospel that he preached in Damascus is the gospel of the grace of God. Not waiting to Antioch, Poseidon, in a whole other territory to preach the gospel. He's been preaching it ever since his conversion in those first three years where he got that gospel message that he preached and certified he got it from Jesus Christ. He taught it in Damascus. And then certainly Syria and Cilicia and Tarsus and then over in Antioch, all before he launched his Acts chapter 13 ministry. So... I believe that the church, the body of Christ, began with Saul's conversion. There is this fading out of one and the coming into the other, and the Acts record is mostly showing the fall of Israel, but it does record Paul's advancing ministry to the Gentiles, but it all centers, began with, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. So... As we talked about, that's the commission, by the way. We talked about the Twelve Apostles Commission and the commission of the Apostle Paul, and then act, when actually did the body of Christ begin. And then next week I want to talk about how does the body of Christ end. So we want to do a, a message about the rapture. And, then, uh, and it won't be a series on the rapture, it'll just be a message on the rapture. And then, uh, then we'll talk about some other things. I, I told you that we're going to be talking about... Uh, um, how the kingdom program is going to begin again, but I forgot to tell you, there's also what I said from the very beginning, there's one verse in the Bible that lays the whole Bible out that I was going to end with, and that's how we'll end the series. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the time spent and pray that the, the things that we said might be a little bit fast, but it's certainly another way of looking at the book of Acts and re-examining uh, all these events that are taking place between 9 and 13 and what actually is transpiring. And so, Father, I pray that uh, we can all look at that and certainly know for sure uh, that this is the dispensation of your grace. The prophetic program is postponed. It is the time of your long suffering, and it's the time of uh, the gospel of the grace of God to go out so that all men can be saved, Jew or Gentile alike, in this special dispensation that we live in. Thank you for it, Father, and help us to always make sure that other people can see that so they don't confuse the prophetic program with the age of grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen.